Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to Cinematic Doctrine. Hey, if you just press play, you're missing out on 42 minutes of content, 40-ish minutes of content. 43 is what I wrote in my notebook. 43 minutes of content where we talk specifically about, I don't know how to say it in particular, but it's me and Melanie talking about there's there's a zeitgeist of Christian, not Christian movies, movies that Christians like or talk Mm -hmm. about um and there are things like um i'll mention like three of them like like uh, nacho libre is one of them chariots (laughs) of fire and the book of eli like like movies that you can kind of see why there's christian themes in them or christian stuff in them and they're accessible that people enjoy um and they're just movies that like people if you walked into a church and like just listen to conversation they'd probably mention or bring up and we kind of just talk about how we've experienced these movies or how they might have affected us it's uh yeah uh, a little longer than i expected but that means it's more content for you and it's exclusive for patreon supporters if you support on three dollars a month uh on our patreon you get access to that and a bunch of other content uh there are other benefits to the podcast or supporting the podcast um and uh that link is of course in the show notes so you can check it out there uh but we are here to talk about the prince of egypt uh, it is yes. Easter month. It's past Easter, but it's Easter month. So we thought of doing Christian movies, which would be fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is specifically one of Melanie's. I can't. I, I know you said it was a favorite Christian movie of yours, but is it also just in general, Melanie, a favorite movie of yours too? Definitely. Definitely a what, favorite. What in particular I've, makes it a favorite? I just think that it's... I talk about it in a several different podcasts. I just love a good story. And mm-hmm. I think that um, the actors, the voice, the the actors who do the the voice acting, they just do an amazing job. I think it's beautifully animated. I think it's yeah. just a really great looking um, film. And the music, I think the music is so good. Anytime, sometimes when I'm in the car, like I'll just play it just so I can listen to it in the background. Like it's really just. I think it's just a great story, a great film. It makes me feel very emotional at different times also because it's um it's from the Bible. It is the story that is um that is in Exodus and the 10 well before the 10 commandments. And um I I think it's done in a way that yes, there is some artistic license that is that is taking that is taken, but uh the essence of the story is still there. And I think they they balance that very very well. So that's why it's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's um, for people who live under a rock and don't get out much. Uh, <laughs> the Prince of Egypt is uh, an early, I think is actually the first DreamWorks produced, DreamWorks animated film. And that's uh, SKG. So that would be Spielberg, Katzenberg, and that other guy that no one ever remembers, uh, which is <laughs> very rude of me, but I'm going to go get it for you <laughs> right now when I can find it. Um, but I, I specifically I thought somewhere. like... Would it be funny to not name him <laughs> because everyone always forgets what the G stands for? But um, <laughs> man, I literally can't find where where is it? Uh, Casting crew. Wow, look at this is what you come here, folks. Real professionalism. 
Um, oh yeah. But uh, it is uh, basically, I think it was right after Katzenberg had left working for Disney. He was working with Disney at the time uh, prior to this. And then at some point stepped away um, to work on other stuff. Uh, I'm not in particular. I, I remember hearing a lot about like, the relationship he had with Disney prior to leaving and then working mm-hmm. on DreamWorks. Um, and I think it was a amicable separation. It wasn't like he was mad or anything, but there were projects he wanted to work on that Disney didn't. And so he went on to Prince of Egypt or onto DreamWorks and then, of course, produced Prince of Egypt. Um, cool. And then, of course, later in his life would produce Quibi, one of the biggest blunders of the 21st century. Um, business blunders mm. of the 21st century. Um, and... Uh, Dream, uh, DreamWorks really had to showcase that they could keep up with Disney's consistent release of really well animated production yeah. companies because it also is showcasing like, hey, support our projects because they're going to be profitable. So they chose Prince of Egypt for that first one. And yeah, like you said, it is some really, really, really great, really great animation. And then on top of that, they're drawing from a story that most everybody would know um, mm-hmm. the Exodus story in part uh, people would know. I think they would know about the plagues. They would know about uh, let my people go. They would know about Mm -hmm. um, uh, running away or escaping enslavement, all positive stuff that people would really connect with, I believe. And um, yeah, so the story itself, yeah, is a, a retelling and readaption of the story of Exodus. There are some changes um, that aren't massive, but are enough to become what I would, what I think Daniel called about the chosen, where it's almost, uh, oh, what is the word he used? It's almost like, um, let's call it like a, there's a filter in which like some stuff is so dramatically inaccurate that you have no problem of it becoming something you mix up with the real scriptures, whereas some stuff mm. becomes so close to it that you actually can sometimes mix it up. Um, and that's not going to be it. a... I'm not negging the Prince of Egypt here, although it is, I think, a slight against it in terms of those who worry about historical texts that are also biblical. Um, yeah. That sometimes you could misconstrue text uh, from the Bible with the scenes in Prince of Egypt, of which my wife and I observed when uh, years ago we were at a small group where uh, we were going over Exodus and somebody kept mentioning, oh, I know this part. This is that part when this. And then everyone would be like, no, that was just in Prince of Egypt. <laughs> Uh, which is always really funny. Uh, like the burning bush. That's, oh, it's because Moses is going to save that one sheep, right? No, it's, it's that's not that, amazing. Yeah. I, it was like constant. I don't know why I love that so much. It, it did not that's stop so the entire time. <laughs> like, it was really great. Um, but it was a really interesting experience of like oh, what man. I guess you could say is like the fear of something like the chosen, which is much more. And I, yeah. I, I know that somebody knew, like they started this episode and said, Malvin's not going to go very far before he mentions the chosen. Um, but it is one of the problems <laughs> in the chosen in that now we're just doing Jesus on screen. So I'd hate for you to misconstrue Jesus, M- misconstruing Moses a little bit. I'm OK, but. Also, don't because he was a historical real figure who's technically still alive. So it's just, you know, it's a little silly. But um, it is, yeah, a decent, really well done, dramatized retelling of of the book of Exodus. Um, Before Mm. we talk about the movie, what is our familiarity with Exodus? Uh, Of course, this is a knowing question uh, for the two of us (laughs) uh, when it comes to uh, the sermons we've been going through. But um, what is your familiarity with the uh, first few chapters? I guess the first 20 chapters Um, of Exodus? Or 18, I I can't remember. You know, there's just one of the great things about the Bible is that you can always go back to it and uncover something new or different that you've never seen before. Or maybe you Mm -hmm. did see it before and then you forgot and then you get to relearn about it and be encouraged again. (laughs) So um, Mm -hmm. I... All that to say, I I feel I feel pretty knowledgeable of the book of Exodus. I have studied it um, on my own and read a commentary on it, but I also we we did it um, at our church. Uh, so it it I feel pretty comfortable with it. And it was interesting because the time that I did the study, that's I knew there were differences between the film and scripture. But that Mm -hmm. was when I actually realized all the differences that were there. And it didn't like, it didn't take away from anything because I was already going in with the knowledge that this would be, the film was different. Things were different from the film. Um, But it was like, wow, I didn't realize like all these things that happened. So I was actually looking at Exodus right now, trying to find it. 
But I remember when I read for the first time, um, Moses's, Moses, Moses's, did I say that right? I think if you were <laughs> spelling it, you would do Moses with a comma. I'm sorry, yeah. an apostrophe, which would imply <laughs> it possessive. Just but in person, I think you can just say, yeah, Moses's. <laughs> Moses's. Um, his <laughs> his um, conversation with the Lord through the burning bush um, when in the Bible, there's a, a, a verse where or verses where it talks about how, um, Moses puts his hand in his cloak. And when yes. he takes it oh, out, yeah, yeah. his hand has leprosy on it, like these yeah. little spots and things. And then when he puts it back in his cloak and takes it out, it's gone kind of like displaying God's power. And I remember reading that mm-hmm. like, Whoa, I didn't realize that happened. That's so cool. I thought he yeah. just took off his shoes and they had a conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but the, those, those details, I think, were just um, really encouraging. They were very interesting. And, you know, you see a lot of yourself in Moses, like how you can, it can be very easy for us to be in our own heads and 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 doubt what we're doing because we feel like we're, we're going to be the ones doing it. And it's like, no the Lord is with you. He will give Mm -hmm. you the words to say it is his power, not your power that will um, be on display. So you may not know this, but the easiest way you can show your support for cinematic doctrine is to rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen. So press pause and share your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you have to say and then press play again. So you can hear the rest of the show. Yeah. Anyway, that's just like a small, tiny example, but mm-hmm. to the point of how, yes, that's not in the film, but I don't think it not being in the film takes away from the film. You, totally. I, cause yeah, I was thinking that, um, um, like the problem would be watching Prince of Egypt in place of, uh, the book of Exodus, whereas like yes. the book of Exodus is the word of God and therefore has nuance and detail that can be beneficial yeah. to you. Whereas the nuance in Prince of Egypt is just clever stuff and also yeah. then changes what is otherwise like perfect in in scripture and so mm-hmm. um you're losing out on that but in terms of my familiarity yeah i've gone through exodus a couple times at this point i've independently read it twice uh and then through studies at like church and stuff we've of course gone over it recently at our church uh we're on a new series now but we had just finished through the whole book um and uh, so, yeah, I would say it's a pretty strong familiarity in terms of the details and specifics. So it was interesting to watch the film and see what they chose to keep, what they chose to draw on. Mm-hmm. They opened the film saying how, like, this is not in place of scripture. They don't say the words I'm saying. I'm, I'm just summarizing. They say, like, it's not in place of scripture. We're taking influence based on history and, like, yeah. uh, guidance and stuff like that. In this particular case, there are a lot of things that I think the film benefits in showcasing things that we definitely do not experience. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll just weren't there to experience. Uh, one thing I thought of that was really empowering when watching the film is the sense of awe and the mm. fact that, like, uh, I, I sometimes ask that of friends in general is like, when's the last time you felt awe? Because, like, awe is like a unique emotion in that you feel humbled, you feel less but you feel it safely in a way that actually makes you feel better. Um, Whereas like fear would almost be like awe in response to danger. Um, Awe in response to positive things actually lifts you up. And it's, it's like a form of glory. Um, And there's a lot of scenes in the film that are just so intense and crazy, especially Mm. towards the end uh, when there's just like nuts stuff happening in the last 10 minutes um where it's just so awe-inspiring the way the visuals are done and the details and just what's being showcased that are um really wonderful to a point that the one of the scenes in the end of the film is just the entire collection of hebrews just looking out at the sea just like Mm. dumbstruck um because they're just they just witness something nuts like just insane just crazy stuff so um i think in that respect like uh Although, yeah, the the film is different from the actual scriptures, the film has its place in perhaps I would say helping to, if we think about the scriptures first, then draws us to understand maybe the scriptures differently um, in a way that's positive and uplifting. Um, Because I sometimes just think in general, like there's God and then there's him speaking to us and then there's us speaking to others 
because God asks us to do that, which then adds a degree in the way, right? It adds mm-hmm. us in the way. Um, and then you add a movie in that. <laughs> so then it becomes God speaking to man who then made movies now speaking to you. That's like four degrees away. You could just go pick up the mm. Bible. <laughs> like, um, yeah, and amen. you wouldn't have so many degrees <laughs> to mess it up. Yeah, um, no, and, that, makes uh, that makes sense. Yeah, and so like in that way, like the things that they change or the things that they might do incorrectly, um, which it, I'm not wouldn't go so far as to say they did anything different out of maliciousness. I think they, they also no, recognize we got to make a movie. <laughs> like we gotta, yeah. like Moses didn't just meet his wife the first time when he went there, she was abducted right. and then she got away. Like, okay, that's cool. Like narrative stuff. Like you get to have some yeah. adventure in that. That's where when you watch a film, I think it's, it can be helpful to understand like, cause you mentioned it earlier, the director's intention for mm-hmm. the film, because then I think it can help you to understand what you're watching, who the audience is for, and then you can decide how you want to take it from there. So so when I think about the film and what the directors were trying and the writers were trying to achieve, it makes sense that all those changes took place. Um, but as a audience member, we can then make the choice. It's like, this is a great story. What does God actually have to say? We then go to to read scripture versus someone else will watch it and just say, oh, this is actually what happened. This is this is everything that was, you know, that that took place. And then but if they but if they and they can do that, but if they knew what the directors had intended, then they mm-hmm. would know, oh, this isn't like an actual historical depiction of what happened um, word for word. This is a this is an interpretation, a retelling of it. So um, mm-hmm. I don't really, and I think that's why a lot of Christians, a lot of the Christians that I know love this film because they understand where the creative, where the creative changes came from and what the intention was. And like you said, it wasn't malicious. It wasn't to, to, to mock or to sneer or to change what they, what they, um, what God has written in his word. And a lot of the really, the really big things are still there. Yeah. For the most part, most of the big things are still there. I I was thinking of like thinking through like what was changed and then why is that significant and what does the original scripture say and why is that? Yeah. What, why does it make it significant to not change it? So like, for instance, one of the plagues is darkness and it's like darkness for three days, but it's literally described as they could not see their hands. Like in front of their faces and like Mm -hmm. it's darkness that could be felt, uh, which is like a unique kind of like darkness. Like this is miraculous darkness and it specifically only hits the Egyptians, not the Hebrews. And there's something really uh, amazing about that. uh, That's almost like, uh, I I can't even really, I I can't even really imagine it. Uh, It's like, it's just so fascinating in that way. It's very unique. Um, But in this film, there's like, enough light to walk around and someone lights a fire and can still see. And it's like dark and scary, but they can still see. And like in that way, like there's something changed now in that change, they have a conversation that then leads up to the next plague. Um, But you don't necessarily see how that plague itself is significant in the darkness. Um, And so you lose out on that. But in terms of narrative flow, it makes sense because you got to move on. That's why the plagues are a montage. Um, and you know why not? Of all things to do, like that makes them, that makes sense to be a montage. But again, by being a montage, you're missing out too on like the early plagues involve both the Egyptians and the Hebrews. And then very soon after that, I think it's like the last eight plagues are only. I'm sorry, there's only eight. Uh, no, I I can't remember. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> the last ten. several plagues. It's ten. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's like the last eight or seven plagues are like exclusively only the Egyptians are get, are getting hit by them. And um, which made me think of like the the film Prince of Egypt doesn't assert almost the sense in which the Hebrews are also, to put it kindly, pathetic and also sinners. Um, like they mm. the they aren't doing anything that warrants God's kindness. Um, yeah. The only thing that essentially you could say is that case is that they're born from Abraham and this this prophecy has been put forth that like this thing will right. happen. And so then they're just praying, yeah. saying what's going to happen. Um, but in that way, like there's nothing to make that distinction. Now they kind of do that with Moses by having him be like a trickster, which just seems like they're making him like a combination between Moses and, uh, Jacob, uh, where Jacob Mm -hmm. basically his whole life never really has it, it, the way I perceive the reading is 
he he almost never has to pray or communicate with God because through clever means and being <laughs> horrible and being yeah. mean uh, is able to take advantage of other people for his own benefit, which is why it's so amazing at the end when Esau's arriving, he recognizes, I can't get out of this one. <laughs> like there's, there's right. nothing I can do to get out of this. Esau's going to kill yeah. me. And that's what makes that um, wrestle with the Lord so wonderful. And then Esau's forgiveness, so amazing. Um, but in this, Moses, this is, and to the scripture's credit, Moses has really very little character until later on when it's important. But it, during the plagues, Moses is on the back seat, and it's more about God versus right. Pharaoh, um, which the film doesn't entirely embrace. I was just going to say, and the film kind of puts Aaron in the back as well, even though in scripture we see that Aaron was yeah. A, I I also thought it was a that, really yeah. really important part. That was a that was also another aspect of the story that when I was studying it was new to me. I was like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I know I didn't realize how important he was. Enjoying this episode? Grab that share link and tell your friends. Word of mouth is the most effective way for a podcast to reach new listeners, so don't be shy. Share the episode wherever you can. In in Exodus we see um when and I'm looking like you can you can see it in chapter seven, Exodus seven, where it talks about Moses and Aaron going before Pharaoh. It's actually Aaron who does the talking, not Moses to Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And then the first sign where the staff turns into a snake, uh, into a snake. Uh, I'm actually looking for the yep. So I think it's verse twelve. Um, for each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But serpents, but Aaron's staff, not Moses. Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs um so it's just really interesting to see how it's like he wasn't just there as like a spokesperson but he actually did things by the power of yeah. god as well so um and i can understand why in the film they wanted it to mostly be about moses and and pharaoh and how they kind of orchestrated that narrative even though that too their brotherly affection really isn't specifically in scripture yeah um in that way uh but no, yeah it was just all. it was interesting how they they did change aaron's character as well but i will argue that at the end um aaron is the first person not that it's in scripture but at least i don't think it is um aaron is the first person to cross the sea and it's him crossing and encouraging people saying like let's go it's mm -hmm. like we can do this um i think in a way that shows how he was like trying to step up and and take some kind of leadership as well and support moses which is what he did in the bible yeah and aaron and miriam stand in as like opposite sides of the hebrew coin and the respect that like aaron is the the hebrews represents like the hebrews that are antagonistic to moses whereas miriam represents yeah hebrews that are not now in scripture there doesn't seem to be hebrews that are not antagonistic to moses at least right. the scriptures don't <laughs> have them yeah <laughs> uh, they're mostly just whenever they're brought up they're antagonistic and not faithful at all they're actually just mad and they're blaming moses they want to kill him at some point i feel like i can't remember but yeah because they because pharaoh had like doubled their work or something like that yeah he he not only doubles their work which in this they say he doubles their work but i believe pharaoh doubles their work and cuts their resources in half so they yes. have to do more work with less, which is just with ridiculous. Less, yeah. so it's like, it's like, yeah, good job, idiot. Like, <laughs> like <just so> dumb. <laughs> right. oh man, the hubris of man. But um, mm. yeah, there's a, I think in that way, like narratively it, it benefits it, but it also, um, if you look at scripture, like it, it changes it because yeah, I think there's something really, uh, I don't need to argue it. Scripture does for me, but there's something important to assuring that like God's kindness is not a conditional. And I think they kind of, like I said, try to do that by making Moses a trickster. And even Ramses tries to kind of throw back shade. Like, like you were right there with me doing all these terrible things or nice, not, like in kid movie, terrible things like swapping over statues or yeah. whatever, and, like dropping Life wine pranks. on people. Um, but yeah, there, there is that, but yeah. Uh, the other thing too, is that this movie's a musical. Um, yes. how did you, how did you think, uh, what did you think about the music? I love 
the music. I yeah, love, yeah, yeah. love capital L, love the music in this um, in this movie. So I think it was uh, Stephen Schwartz who did the songwriting, and he's a lyricist. Mm-hmm. Very good one. And then the orchestral score was done by the one and only Hans Zimmer. So if you're a Lion mm-hmm. King fan or you're a fan of Pirates of the Caribbean um, or Gladiator, he did the the film scores for that. That's why there's so many themes that sound the same, but I'm not going to get into that because that's just me being a <laughs> music nerd. <laughs> but anyway, so I just think it's I love the first song, Deliver Us, because you really just get really good. Oh, so good. And you and you get really this good, sense yeah. of their desperation and their and their toiling. So even just how they're describing their work, mud, sand, water, yes. you know, like just like you get this like all this like hard labor. And then I think her name is um I'm trying to find it. I think it's Ofra Haza. I'm gonna. I, th- I think composers? that's wrong. No, she's yes, Ofra Haza. She plays um, Yocheved, which is the mother of Moses. And um, as she's described in the film, she's like, you know, running away to save her son, and she sings to her son this beautiful lullaby. But I was like, that name sounds so familiar, and I think she's also um, lends her beautiful voice in the movie Gladiator as well. Mm -hmm. And with that movie became this like trend of this kind of style of singing that sounds like very heartfelt and just like almost as if you're doing like this very passionate outcry. Um, Mm -hmm. I won't attempt to imitate it because I'll probably do a bad job, but (laughs) and I don't want to be insulting in any way. But um, if you just listen to her sing the lullaby and then you hear her like kind of um, singing out at the end, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. But anyway, I just thought that was a beautiful thing to add to the film as well. Um, And the my favorite song is the song between Moses and his brother during the plagues. I just think yeah, that's such a great yeah, yeah. choral song. It's a really so you good have one. like yeah, so you have like this like very rhythmic talking about the plagues, like I'll send the pestilence and this and that. And it's just like, thus saith the Lord. Like this is coming from these plagues are coming from the Lord. And <laughs> um uh it's just the the singers and the actors do such a great job. But what I do want to say that I also really appreciate about the film is that not every actor is singing. Do they have other uh uh, oh man, what's the term? Uh, they have other people come in to sing their voices. So like Val Kilmer isn't singing as Moses. Yes, yeah. So okay. Val Kilmer isn't singing. It's uh, I was gonna try to find him really quick. Emic Byram. 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 Yeah. And then okay. for Jethro, who's originally played by um, Danny Glover, you have a really famous Broadway singer, uh, Brian Stokes Mitchell, who does the singing, and he does a fabulous mm-hmm. job. So that's what I mean. Like there's just the actors don't always have to do the singing because sometimes they can and it sounds fantastic, but then sometimes the voices are like, okay, or they might not be as good or able to like keep up with everybody else. So I'm like, so if that's the case, just do what they did in this film. Just get somebody else to do the singing. There is literally no shame. It is totally fine. But now I feel like we live in a time where it's like the actors have to do everything. And maybe some of them actually want to, but I, I just really appreciated the quality of the singing. Yeah. Just, I think the songs are just so you can tell they're well thought out. They're, they're fully formed songs. They're not just kind of slapped together. Mm -hmm. I just, I just think the, 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 and it's consistent. Like you can feel like a a similar, similar things in like the style and the, in the, um, choice of instruments and the in the singing like it, it doesn't feel like you're hearing songs from different genres or for different places it all feels like it all mm-hmm. belongs in the same movie even the song the the last song the miracle song mm-hmm. when you believe the song isn't a christian song it's just not but um because <laughs> i remember listening to it recently and i was like maybe uh no i'm not gonna go there but- <laughs> well elaborate why why not because when you look at the lyrics, they're just very vague. Oh, so is it like, um, it's like the end of Wonder Woman 1984 when uh, Gal Gadot is just saying, uh, 
It's like when she's like sitting there, she's like, the truth is enough. And there's, cause yeah. you can't fight the truth. And it's just like vagaries. <laughs> they don't mean anything. <laughs> it's so yes. stupid. No, it's true. Look, I'm looking at these lyrics and I'm laughing because of what you're saying. It says, we were moving mountains long before we knew we could. I'm like, um, you weren't moving anything. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's number one <laughs> that was the lord or the the chorus there can be miracles when you believe the hope is frail it's hard to kill i'm like okay who knows what miracles you can achieve <laughs> and you can't Dumb see words. my face but i'm 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 given the Dumb. i'm given that skeptical look <laughs> it says when you believe somehow you will and it's like there's no question how all of this is happening because throughout the whole film it's very clear the lord is somehow delivering people palpatine right. has returned <laughs> it's like no it's because it's a miracle <laughs> palpatine returned because it's a miracle <laughs> right and just oh like gosh. there's just like lines in this that just don't make any sense i i don't think this was this wasn't and this is what's sad it's there's a there's a there's a it's not sad but it it's it's interesting there's a part in the movie where they sing um in hebrew and i believe Mm -hmm. don't quote me the hebrew they're singing is is exodus 51 i think it's 51 where they sing a song of praise after they've been delivered yeah i was i didn't have time to look but i was curious if they did like the song of moses or anything like that in there and i think Um, they did because i was talking to our pastor about it and he said yes that it was the um the same the same words and that just brought the song up a level for me because i'm like at least that's in there and i think it's (laughs) it's really really beautiful to hear them singing in, in in hebrew Um, and it's just so beautiful, especially at the end when you hear the choir, like, uh, it's just such a beautiful sound. I wish this song was more Christian, was Christian Mm -hmm. period. If the song could at least mean something, (laughs) it doesn't sound like it means anything. It sounds like all of the lyrics for the greatest showman are just like, (laughs) like, it's like none of those lyrics mean anything. (laughs) Right. I mean, they're all singing about the same thing. I love the greatest uh, showman, but you're, you are correct. Um, but they have. (laughs) You know, they wanted Mariah Carey and Whitney. They got Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston to sing this song. So maybe they just wanted to be. Yeah, a bunch of vagaries. Hey there, listener. Want to influence the podcast? Head on over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support the show for $3 a month. In doing so, you'll be able to vote on a movie poll that picks a film we discuss each month. So jump on over there and have your voice heard. On the music, I think um, I think the music's good. It's surprisingly weird music. I actually found that like not weird as in bad, but weird as in like the genre styles here are really like sometimes it's almost like um, it, it sounds a lot more like some of the theater musicals I've seen where sometimes they're just like talking in a conversation and they just start singing the conversation. Yeah, it's it's very much like a theater musical. Definitely. But uh, on the on the topic of then, yeah, yeah, the music I thought was surprisingly strange um, and occasionally hit or miss for me. Um, Sometimes when we're doing stuff for the podcast, like I really just engage it as like I wouldn't call it work like this isn't work, but I would really engage it as like I'm doing this for the show. And so like my enjoyment sometimes isn't as high as if I just put something on for like fun. Um, And so like I think if I put it on for fun, I would have liked the music a lot more or engage with it mm. more. Uh, but it was also surreal because I watched this a lot as a kid. And then as I'm watching, I'm like, I don't remember anything <laughs> from this movie. <laughs> I think I remember the nose falling down from the statue. And it was oh, just yeah, really yeah, surreal. Yeah. Which it was bizarre. But um, uh, but then you were also talking about the actors. Um, when I texted a friend that we were going to talk about this, he was like, are you guys going to talk about like, um, what's the term? Stunt casting? Where like you just cast a bunch of not voice actors to come in and do like voice acting work. Mm. Um, and I was like, I guess I could mention that. Cause like, yeah, the cast here is Val Kilmer, Ralph Finesse, my, Michelle Pfeiffer, Sandra Bullock, uh, Jeff Goldblum, Danny Glover, Patrick Stewart, Helen Miram, Steve Martin, Martin Short, um, a bunch of people who, as you will all know, <laughs> are not voice actors. Um, yeah. Although I guess some of them have done voice acting work, but not all of them, but also they're all not, I'm not familiar with their nationalities, but for the most part are not um, natively Jewish. Um, And so there's 
uh, in hindsight, I know that there's criticism about that. Not in a strong way. People still love this movie and it's still a really good movie. Right. Um, but there is a way in which like that is the case. Now I've always thought this, I don't know which one's which out of Steve Martin or Martin short in the movie. I know who's which, <laughs> but like, um, <laughs> but like in the movie, one of their voices is one of the characters and it never fits the whole time. Mm. And even Jeff Goldblum's is a, clo- a bit close, but they're all still, um, good they're all still really good but it is a little strange and i know the most recent form of stunt casting was with the mario brothers movie although bowser was good jack black though has basically been voice acting forever at this point Um, yeah not in overtly but like when he was when he's doing tenacious d it's just a bunch of voice work so um Mm. oh so we had already i had already asked like what makes this one of your favorite movies but then you said you wanted to talk about what makes it a particularly favorite christian movie do you do you watch first off do you watch a lot of christian movies or movies that are at least tagged christian or anything like that faith based no. stuff like that why is that cuz i've gotten um i've just been disappointed too many times mm-hmm. for different reasons um either the film pretends to be christian but is not um mm-hmm. cuz to me a christian film is going to is going to share the gospel like because if you are if you are labeling your film as a Christian film, not like, you know, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe or Lord of the Rings where, like, the themes are there, but it's not labeled right. a Christian film. Because yeah. even – I won't get into that. But the point is, is, like, if you're saying we are a Christian film, we are here to do this thing, well, the thing is the gospel. And I just yeah. feel like if that's just not going to be there – then you failed to do what you wanted to do unless you want, unless maybe you wanted to be a Christian film, but you wanted to talk about something else. I just think that it's a little, for me, it's a little bit strange. So I watched um, heaven is for real in the theaters because two of my friends wanted me to go watch it with them. So I was like, fine. And it was exactly <laughs> I what I thought it was. I saw the asterisk just appear out of nowhere and a little <laughs> subscript on the bottom saying like, I was taken against my will. I did not want to go see this. They bought the ticket. I just wanted popcorn. <laughs> Basically. So, and I fell asleep and they fell asleep at different times. It was boring. And also it turns out that wasn't even based on a true story. It, Cause the exactly. kid came out and was like, I lied. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Like it's so, and it's on I, my I shelf. Can't... I picked that up at a thrift store. We're totally doing it on the podcast. Oh my gosh. I hope you know that. <laughs> uh. I don't know if I'm going to make it, Melvin. You might, you might need a guest host for that one. No, so, but it was, Melanie, is heaven is for real a party pleaser or a party pooper? It's just, it's, it's not even a party. You just put that in the trash. Like, it's just bad. It's a wake. So, Everyone who watches it in the room just dies. <laughs> heaven is for real. And we're going there right now. Oh my gosh. It's just, it was dope. so, it just had no redeemable qualities to it. And, Whoa. and I, like, it just, <laughs> there was, like... I, I can't stress enough how disappointed I was with this film. And it just, if the gospel was there, I was asleep when it happened. So, <laughs> so, that's and so that's funny. just an example of a film that I think just doesn't do what it, what it could do or what I think it should do as a Christian film. Your experience with Christian movies or Christian tagged movies, Christian and name movies is not good. It sounds like right. whenever you watch them, they're not well made or they're not engaging. Right. Or um, I would almost rather like a corny, cheesy Christian movie that clearly shared the gospel as opposed to um, a movie that might be really, really well done, but the gospel is just like, or scripture even is just nowhere to be found. Or when they misuse it, ugh, that would be just, that's just so discouraging. Just to kind of see that as well, they just kind of threw it in there because they thought it fit. Yeah, I do find I find that um, because I've heard that too before. Where like if if it's going to be called a Christian movie, then it needs to have the gospel mentioned, which in in short would be like find a narrative way to say like, you know, maybe not all of humanity is sin, but that the characters who needs to go through the change, the dynamic character, or maybe they're static and they never change. But the the concept of you are a sinner and uh, you sinned against God but God has made a way for you to be saved through his, the sacrifice in Christ. And if you believe yeah. in him, if you believe that that's true, if you believe what God said is true and you believe then 
Christ, then you'll be saved. Um, that would be the gospel. And there are ways in which you can narratively say that or even artistically to express that. Because, yeah, there are there are other movies that I would say like are I I almost never use the title Christian movie unless I'm talking specifically about movies that are like produced or mar- I would say marketed for Christians. So yes. like First Reformed, I wouldn't call a Christian movie, but it's definitely Christian setting wise um, mm-hmm. or like any Malick movie. Terrence Malick is like not necessarily a Christian movie, but is very much like sp- Christ- Christian or Catholic spiritually imbued. Um, the last episode we did was Tree of Life. And so people obviously heard about some of that. But that one's I would definitely say it's like, yeah, definitely Christian inf- influence. Hey, don't forget, there's a lot of fun content missing from this episode because you're not listening on Patreon. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine and support for $3 a month to gain access to uncut episodes with upwards of 40 minutes of bonus content each. You'll thank me later. But yeah, I too have like, like I just recently, a couple months ago, maybe a month or two ago, I watched Joshua, which is like that. What if Jesus mm-hmm. came back, but specifically to like Midwest? It's super weird. Um, huh. And it's like silly because they're believing the same gospel, but then like that gospel is when Christ returns, trumpets will horn, trumpets will be sounded, and like you know the 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 the, the ending part of the end times begins, that kind of thing. The the order of eschatology is uh, you know debated, but I digress. And yet, in this particular case, Jesus comes back to then like <laughs> tell the Pope to do better. It's so stupid. Oh, it's so bad. But it's like really, really bad. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, that would be like a movie that was marketed to Christians based off a book that was made for Christians, sold in Christian bookstores, which at a time was like the gateway to getting, uh, marketed through Christianity. And oftentimes they end up being pretty bad. Now to at least kind of like tie it with like Prince of Egypt, do you find that just like Prince of Egypt satisfies? Cause it's not like, like I kind of mentioned, like, it's not really Christian, it's more Jewish, but it's also like, yeah. as Christians, we believe that it's based on historical fact um Mm -hmm. do you just find that it hits those bases in a way that are more palatable more agreeable because it doesn't have the gospel but it's a well-made movie that's also more accurate like like how how does that wrestle in your mind so i think for me just the fact that there were just so many there were elements of scripture that were used correctly was just mm-hmm. something that I really appreciated. So when Moses meets the Lord, how he takes off his shoes because he is standing on holy ground, how mm-hmm. when he starts to object, the things, the dialogue that's being said is in scripture. And I feel like that mm-hmm. just even 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 hearing um, Val Kilmer being the voice of God as well, just in my mind, I'm like, oh, it's Moses hearing the Lord in his mind. I thought that was kind of interesting. At least that's, that's kind of a clever, yeah. Yeah. That's, but, that's good though. Yeah. Yeah. And how it was just like you, his voice was, was loud and full of authority, but then was also very sweet and very tender. And these are the things mm. that we see of the Lord in scripture. So to me, it's like, it matches what I know of who God is and who, um, who we see him to be in his word. So I feel like the essence of, of God's character was honored in a way that I could understand and appreciate and respect. And so throughout the film, even though certain things were changed, I think the most important things, not most, well, I guess you could say most important or just like the major things that take place were, Mm -hmm. were, were correct. Even just seeing the end, the tablets coming down the mountain there's like this symbol of hope. There's like a sense of reverence and care yes. for the material that's yes. like oftentimes missing from Christian marketed materials where exactly it's it very it, it's um disingenuous that often material Christian made materials come off as incorrect. And I think that's why like the Prince of Egypt kind of comes off enjoyable is because it's like it it I mean the fact that the opening is so it's it's this tone setter that's really rough, like the mm. fact that they're like enslaved and it's like they're not treated kindly. And then we basically see like the most PG version of like <laughs> the slaughter of a, like a thousand babies. Yeah. Um, we see it twice. <laughs> and so like, yeah. Um, and so they, they, there is a reverence to not shy away from what is true, uh, yes. which is 
that God is in sovereign control of both good and evil um, mm-hmm. and also hates evil. Yeah. Um, and I think those are a lot of things that are shied away from for obvious reasons because they're mm-hmm. confusing to to hold those things together. And I often find even in conversation with non-Christians that that idea of God being sovereign over all things, but then evil mm-hmm. exists is like the, like the number one like thing that's so frustrating. If it's, if I'm talking yeah. to someone who's non-gendered, they're like, well, God didn't make mistakes. So like, how is it that like, if God didn't make mistakes or anything like that, and I'm perceived as non-gender, then how is that? how would that be considered wrong? So like just the concept of sin existing immediately comes into categories of incorrect. Whereas if you read the original scriptural text, like you mentioned, the fact that the Lord has Moses put his hand in his, in his pocket and bring it out and it's a leprous and then put it back showcases also that the Lord is in control of curses is in control of, of evil. The fact that it's the snake is symbolically is like what brought, uh, what, what, escalated the entrance of sin i would not escalate it but you know what precipitated the entrance of sin into the world it was a Mm. snake um and so there's um there's a lot of reverence and knowingness to the the information that's shared through prince of egypt even the fact that like moses steps forward and drops the staff it turns into a snake and it just happens in front of everybody's eyes and then ramses is like okay uh um magicians do your work and they do this crazy flashy show yeah smoke comes out and over and then snakes are in their hands and it's like that means they had lights pyrotechnics and all this stuff to just make (laughs) snakes appear and it's like yo at any point i could have blinked and missed it so meanwhile moses just drops it and god makes it a snake in front of their eyes and so yeah um, there's like a there's this oh just a willingness to showcase uh yeah just a lot of care for all these things that yeah i I typically do not see in in also christian marketed media and that's in contrast to like fictional stuff whereas this is based on history so they have something Mm -hmm. to work on whereas like christian fiction uh sometimes also has the same problem where it's just not reverential or or even knowledgeable it almost feels like it's not being written by someone who's reading the bible at all sometimes it it, it feels really strange yeah and i think just what's also great about the the Prince of Egypt is that it leaves room for conversations about the gospel yes, and how this was a foreshadowing of our deliverance from our sin through the prophet, the, the son of God, the one we've been waiting for, you know, the greater Moses. And so I think if a Christian film can, can achieve that even, I think there's there's something there. So like if you want to tell this fictional story and you want the characters to be relatable, you want it to feel real, it's like, yes, you can do those things. But I think yes. on the other side of that, there needs to be what also is the the truest thing, God's word, God speaking to us yes. and room and conversations to talk about the gospel to see redemption in motion, you know, like in someone's Mm -hmm. life, I think is just so powerful to even just have a character speak to another character in the film and just encourage them through scripture or through prayer. And just to say the name of Jesus, you know, without shame or like, you know, there's a greater power out there. Just say who he is. It is God. It is the Lord. And so um, I don't have tons of experience with Christian movies just because from the few that I saw, I just didn't enjoy them very much. But I do think it's I do think it's it it there are good films out there. I do think it's possible. And I think the Prince of Egypt is is one of them. And I think it's why people love it so much. It's because you have all of these all of these things in it and it feels true to to what we to the essence of, like you said, it's it's reverent of of scripture. Well, even to your point, I think that's also why people enjoyed when it came out a couple of years ago. At this point, I think it was 2013 or 14, uh, The Case for Christ, when that adaption came out of Lee Strobel's life. like People enjoyed it because it's a well-made movie that's reverential mm-hmm. to the material that's extremely well-performed, in my opinion. Not extremely, but very competently well-performed. It's a good-looking movie. Um, mm-hmm. It's a very good-looking movie, the way it's shot. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a project that, that shows like direction and intent 
Um, because like you're watching Prince of Egypt and these visuals, we didn't talk about that, but like <laughs> they are crazy good and very like telling. Um, mm-hmm. Like even the fact that um, in the beginning you get this wide shot of Moses and, and Ramses getting chewed out by their dad, the Pharaoh. Uh, and there's a wide shot showing Pharaoh standing and then behind him is a statue. Yeah, And it's awesome. It's a really cool imposing shot. But then, 40, well, not 40 years later. In this case, it's probably like 20 years later because that's another yeah. change. Like Moses <laughs> right. leaves when he's 40, comes back when he's 80, and then he reaches the promised land and doesn't get to go in when he's like 120. So, But um, yeah. when he comes back to talk with Ramses, Ramses has built another statue taller than mm-hmm. his dad in the background. And um, so there's a lot of like background details in that way yes. that are less f- on the focus um, that really feed into like, people looked at what they were working on and meditated on how they wanted to share this story and information yes. and details and continued to then tell on it. I, I read that one person's interpretation of when, um, uh, in, of the movies showcase of this, not necessarily what happens in scripture, but when Moses turns the, uh, when the Lord, uh, uses Moses to turn yes. the, the Nile into blood and then, Ramses has his magicians do the same and the magicians just basically they they put in like Kool-Aid <laughs> into the right, water like some kind of dye. Kool-Aid. It's so funny. Um uh, but like uh that person likes to interpret that when Ramses puts his hand in it it's like the consistency he might even know that it doesn't feel like blood at all cuz blood is gross. Uh it is yes. sticky and grimy and cloudy. It is disgusting. Yeah. Like you figure in it's that thick. hot sun that the Nile probably like within 10, 20 minutes had like a, a thick clot of blood on the top. Just gross to think about. Ugh, I don't even want to say it anymore. It's just gross. <laughs> but like, you probably can see like Ramses did that. And then for the sake of pride and showcasing the Moses that he can do it, just could lie and say like, yeah, my, my magicians did it too. And it's like, <laughs> really? <laughs> like even the way it appears is different. Like when yes. Moses puts the staff in and they display it, it looks like blood in water. Whereas in, yes. when, when the magicians do it, it just looks like Kool-Aid. It's so Yeah, the color is so different. Crazy. If I rem- if I remember correctly, in the Nile is like a deeper, richer red. It's but gross. then when he, like yeah. you're saying, when he puts his hand in, it's like an orangey bright, yeah, br- more brighter colored red that's actually an interesting detail i'm just remembering that as you're talking about it that's true yeah and it like it really asserts that like what's at play is more than just like magic tricks you have this man whose pride is and his need for power being so strong i do wish the movie in had in more i wish it shows the hebrews and their experience but it doesn't show a lot of the egyptians because um, for those who have not read Exodus, one of the most crazy parts, in my opinion, is um, I think it's when the first plague happens, when the blood is in the Nile. They're mm. all drinking water. It's, I believe it's not just blood in the Nile, but blood in pots, yeah, too. I think So I think all drinking so. water is gone. And you're like in Egypt. Yeah, maybe you can confirm for me. But it's uh, there's nothing to drink. So the Egyptians are scouring. They're digging into the sand to try to find water. Yes, and it says that, I think I remember Was this. I right? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna Ramses find it, steps but I think out. You're right. Pharaoh steps out and he looks out at all of the Egyptians crying and freaking out, and then he just turns around and walks away. <laughs> like it is brutal. He doesn't. He's mm-hmm. saying that he's God, that he makes the sun rise and fall, uh, or whatever. At least in scripture, he doesn't say that, but that's a typical thing for pharaohs. But they, the fact that he is supposed to be their God, but he doesn't even try helping them is crazy. Right. Whereas God Himself. Uh, does in fact help the Hebrews, but you you got the yeah you got the scripture there. Was I right or I don't know? I yeah, you were remember. correct. It's it's chapter seven. I'll start at verse twenty two. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. Um, seven full days passed after the Lord struck the Nile. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, yeah. So it's yeah. just like, he's just watching this happen and he just doesn't care and walks away. It's just yeah, terrible. I think, <laughs> I think oh, further man. up, it talks about it too. It said the Nile turned to blood and the fish in the Nile died and the Nile stank so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood Gross. throughout the land of Egypt. 
It says rivers, canals, ponds, all pools of water uh, so that they would become blood and there shall be blood throughout the land of Egypt, even the vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Yeah, so it's so like there's there's literally it. nothing. And if you're trying to you can't do anything with that. You can't clean, you can't drink, you can't bathe. So it's yeah. just like there's going to be people who are already doing all three of those things and it just happens mm-hmm. and it's like seconds I'm assuming. And so there is a real sense of danger that then like for him like he's just turning around and walking away. Like just he's a monster. And so I I think um while the film itself is very good uh, you know, you don't need to hear it from us, but read the Bible. <laughs> like it is, Amen. it is some fascinating literature. Um, yeah. and it's, it is crazy. And then, and when you're like, if, if you accept it as truth, the, the, the richness of what you can draw out from it is much more than what you'll draw out from even just the, what we're both agreeing is general richness of the, the filmmaking here, the animation here of the Prince of Egypt. Um, but it's a uh, yeah, I, I do. I think like a more present nastiness in that respect would be appreciated in the film by having like, yeah, maybe like just the fact that the Hebrews even are more aggressive with Moses um, or when they lead him out to the um, they they wanted the, the climax, right? They wanted the climax with the parting of the Red Sea to be done artistically. That's why no one really talks during that sequence. Um, but you're missing out on like uh, Moses specifically says to everybody, just stand still, let your God fight for you. And then God yells, rebukes at Moses and is like, what are you doing? Put Lift your hands and part the sea. Um, and that's an interesting respect of how there's still separation between m- what Moses perceives and what the Lord's perceiving. Um, but then in that way, there's still faith taking place. And uh, anyways, it's just... There's a lot of richness uh, going on here that uh, is simultaneously expressed and appreciated um, in terms of being a biblical adaption, but then also uh, so much, so much more to be drawn from. Did you know Cinematic Doctrine has a blog? Visit cinematicdoctrine.com to read extended thoughts on movies or movie industry news from our contributors. Plus, you can find our podcast on there, too. Uh, but yeah, Melanie, do you want to get us started on um, on our uh, recommendations? So I would say let's have you start because I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. The first few times you were doing this, I forgot every time. It's all good. Oh my gosh. There was a couple I times forgot. I just got up and I looked at my list. shelf and was like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that one. <laughs> yeah. Give me a second, guys. My voice like gets distant and stuff. But yeah, I'm going to start it. I'll... Um, I was going to recommend something else, but I'll save it for another time um, because it wouldn't be totally relevant. But while we were talking here, it reminded me that A Case for Christ is a pretty good movie. And so Hmm. not great, not perfect, but I think a pretty well-made, well-performed movie. Um, It looks good, like I said. Um, You'll find it edifying and uh, educational um, because of the things that Lee Strobel does to try to disprove the historical truth of Christ are... uh, True. Like they essentially like they the film cleverly weaves in these things that are historical truths and facts into dialogue that is natural, which is one of the biggest problems of most Christian marketed materials, which is it just turns into sermons and then it goes back to fiction and it never seems to meld the two together. But this it does well. Um, I've mentioned before on the podcast before, but you basically watch as Lee Strobel's character his performer goes from stable to instable as the film continues because he's becoming Mm. more and more frustrated and flustered at the fact that he cannot find a way to disprove Christ. Um, And I think that that's a good performance. Um, And uh, yeah, so definitely, definitely check it out. I'm not really sure where it's streaming now, but as usual, you can just check our show notes and I have a link to just watch for it. Um, But yeah, it is a, it's a good flick. So case for Christ, check it out. I am. I feel kind of bad, but I am not recommending a Christian film. Just because, whatever. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have one that's popping up into my head right now, but this is completely off topic. This is very random. Oh, I'm excited. Um, I'm recommending Beetlejuice. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Beetlejuice is, for me, a classic. Um, and it's not even spelled like Beetle and then Juice. Beetlegees. Uh, Beetle geese, right? So Beetlejuice is a um, Tim Burton. Yes, that's Tim correct. Tim Burton film. 
Um, it has Michael Keaton in it, and it has Gina Gina Davis and one of the Baldwin brothers. I can't remember his first name. Uh, Alec. Is it Alec? He's the dad, right? I can't remember. Yeah, he's the the husband. Yeah, and then um, oh my gosh, uh, Winona, Winona Ryder. Ryder, goth queen of the universe. Yes, absolutely. Her <laughs> outfit is fabulous. It is constantly being redone, and people are imitating her all the time. I am alone. <laughs> I am utterly alone. <laughs> so good. <laughs> my life is one big black dark room i think she says something like that in the film um but anyway it's it's fantastic so it's just about a young couple who um who meets a un unexpected death and when they return to the real world they find that things have changed that people have moved into their house and they try to get their house back by haunting them and they realize that they're terrible at it. So then they try to enlist the help of a, he's like an exorcist of the living. I forget. Like yes, he has, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he has like a, a name for himself, but he's, his name is Beetlejuice, but he is not who he seems to be and not as trustworthy as they um, would have hoped for. So just lots of really fun, interesting, adventurous things that take place. It's just really well written, really well directed. It has such a great look. Um, very Tim Burton. So if you've seen any of his other films, you'll see a lot of familiar colors and shapes and, and things like that. But it's a favorite for me. I, I really love this film. It's a classic. And if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll enjoy it. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once-a-month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck. We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.